Flashbacks have long been utilized in cinema dating all the way back to the silent era, a technique that Ingmar Bergman was continuously fascinated with, particularly in much of his early films, with several of them framing the entire main plot as a flashback and only having a handful of scenes set in the present, usually as bookends. Waiting Women, Summer Interlude, A Ship to India, To Joy, A Lesson in Love, and more all incorporate flashbacks, usually in large degrees and with much skill. But it would be in 1957, just over ten years of directing films, in which Bergman would truly master the flashback with his film Wild Strawberries. But these aren't just traditional flashbacks. Bergman here transcends the basic use of flashbacks as a device to simply show events from the past. Instead, he mixes flashbacks, dreams, and subjective memory to create a meditation on our past, our regrets, and the cycle of life. Isak Borg is an old widowed professor traveling across Sweden to receive an honorary doctorate for his life's work in medicine. His daughter-in-law, Marianne, accompanies him on his trip during which their grievances with each other very quickly come to light. He ridicules her in an off-handed fashion that is guised in his, as Marian puts it, old world manners and charm. Isak doesn't take notice of his own behavior as he can't even remember the things he said to Marianne when she quotes his own insulting words to him. Much of the film's emotional core is centered around the segments that focus on the summer house of Isak's youth, wherein we see past and present merge. We see the present-day old Isak entering the picture of his youth with all the rest of the family as they once were, preserved in the past, including his old love Sara, who chose Isak's brother Siegfried over him. We see the boisterousness of his family, particularly of his own youthful generation. Young twin girls sing a song for their uncle's name date, despite him being all but deaf. Young, naive, romantic feelings blossom. The very refined decor of lace and pines scattered around the house. The whole family gathered around the table. All of it makes for a very comforting memory of innocent youth. And that is what these are. Memories. Not so much flashbacks. We are seeing present-day Isak remembering these times and interacting in these scenarios, which prompts us to wonder as to how accurate they really are. We can fairly safely assume the wider aspects of the memories are accurate more or less, but the accuracy of some events is brought into question, since there is no indication that Isak actually witnessed most of what we are shown, despite old Isak being our guide and point of view into such events. This is unlike the memory from later in the film that depicts Isak's wife getting entangled with another man, in which it is clearly stated by a character that Isak did indeed witness this event. As a result, we can gather that the events that Isak was not witness to, but is nevertheless remembering, are constructed by his mind in close accordance with what really happened, though perhaps not exactly how they happened. Isak remembers the summer house very well, and knows that Sara chose his brother over him, so he constructs the scenario of how exactly that pairing happened. Therefore, we are forced to question certain things, such as when Isak sees the despair that Sara feels for betraying Isak, both in the scene in which Sara and Siegfried kiss, and in the next scene in which the twins mock her for it, causing Sara to storm out of the dining room and confess to another character that she feels regret for it, going on about how kind Isak is. One could simply take this at face value and say that it really did happen as shown, but how exactly would Isak remember this if not there himself? Would he simply like to believe that Sara was regretful, but in fact wasn't? Or was she genuinely regretful? Perhaps he heard about these events through other people after the fact. We're left to wonder. This also brings in another interesting angle through which to view the film, and that is as a fantasy fable. Of course, elements of the film do more obviously resemble a fable, particularly evoking It's a Wonderful Life and A Christmas Carol through its narrative of a man learning to appreciate life. But the two aforementioned stories are more explicitly fantasy, in which angels and ghosts literally appear and interact with our protagonists. Wild Strawberries, on the other hand, has no such obvious supernatural elements, but that's not to say that there isn't an undercurrent of the supernatural. These very scenes in question of Isak remembering things he never experienced firsthand are the key to giving the film its this more fantastical feel, as if we were experiencing It's a Wonderful Life, but without Clarence to show our protagonist these scenes. The protagonist simply sees them for himself. No clear magic trickery, no questioning of how this could possibly be happening, like George Bailey or Ebenezer Scrooge would be frantically asking. Wild Strawberries presents a more fluid, surreal, and calm approach to these types of scenes, 
putting more focus on the protagonist's psychology and his individual experience instead of bringing attention to the logistics of how these scenes are occurring. This is further compounded by the dream sequences in the film, such as the opening in which Isak sees himself in a coffin next to a clock with no hands. Later in the film, Isak journeys through an odyssey of scenarios that bring together the three types of surreal scenes used throughout the film. He first sees his love, Sarah, together with Siegfried and their baby, akin to the summer house segments that sees Isak remembering or constructing events that he never witnessed. He is then being questioned in a classroom about things that do not make any logical sense, such as having to read words off a board that he doesn't understand, mimicking the dream that opens the film where he sees himself in a coffin. This odyssey then concludes with Isak reliving his wife's infidelity in the same vein as the flashback we see later in the film of Marianne telling Evald that she is pregnant, due to both being past events that we see through the point of view of an actual witness of said event. The cycle of dream sequences, subjective flashbacks, and flashbacks that are more surreal in nature all paint a much grander portrait of a man going through a momentous, almost spiritual change, evolving in the late stages of his life into a better, more compassionate person as he relives the moments that have turned him into the cold man Marion describes him as at the beginning of the film. The demons that have pervaded his life, the breaking of his heart by Sarah, his overhearing of his wife's disgusted feelings toward him, the coldness of his own mother which he seems to have inherited. Which brings us to the other major element of Wild Strawberries, and that is the cycle of generations. We see three different generations throughout the film. The elderly, represented by Isak himself, his mother, and Isak's housekeeper Agda, who are mostly shown to be crabby and cold. Isak's mother represents the core message of the dangers of what one could become later in life. Then there is the middle generation of Marianne, her husband and Isak's son, Evald, and the couple that the characters almost crashed into on their trip. As the couple continue to pester and badger at each other the entire time after being given a ride by Isak and the rest, we see that this generation is beginning to become disillusioned with life and the relationships they've become entangled with. We see a milder but no less sad portrayal of this feeling in the flashback wherein Marianne recounts to Isak about her recently telling Evald that she is pregnant. We see that the two got into a disagreement of what to do, as Evald doesn't want the child, but Marianne does. At this point in the film, we've already witnessed the chaos of the married couple Isak and Marianne picked up, so we are reminded, watching this flashback, of what Marianne and Evald could turn into. Then lastly, there is the younger generation, shown through Victor, Anders, and the hitchhiker Sara, who shares a name and bears striking resemblance to Isak's old love, Sara. Both are played by B.B. Anderson. Now, whether or not this character literally looks exactly like Isak Sara is really beside the point. Perhaps she looks exactly the same, or perhaps Isak is just picturing her that way. What matters is that Isak is reminded of his Sara through this new Sara. We get to see the boisterousness of these young people from the first time we meet them, as they are introduced as free-spirited travelers gallivanting all the way down to Italy as they hitch a ride with Isak and Marianne. These three generations tell a broader story of the outlooks that are passed down and of the exuberance and sense of adventure that are eroded as we age. But Bergman also shows how we can stop that cycle and redeem ourselves by looking back at our past, examining where we might have gone wrong and why, and how we can correct our behavior and outlooks that might be making us miserable, just as Isak does throughout the film. He realizes, through the help of Marianne and the hitchhiker girl Sarah, that his cold demeanor is rooted in his upbringing with his mother and in his scars throughout life relating to his feelings of betrayal by Sarah and his deceased wife that have left him feeling lonely and betrayed. As he begins to see that he is in danger of passing on that same cold attitude to his only son. Throughout the trip, Isak gets to understand and sympathize with Marianne, in part due to her confiding in him Evald's animosity toward her pregnancy. Isak sees himself in both her and his son at that moment. In Marianne, he sees the man who was himself abandoned by his great love as a youth. And in Evald, he sees the selfish, cynical man that he has become in his old age. Marianne then tells him that the cycle must stop somewhere, and so Isak takes it upon himself to do just that. By the end of the film, Isak apologizes to Agda for his behavior of that morning, convinces Evald to give it another try with Marianne and their child that is on the way, while also trying to tell Evald to not worry about paying him back for the money that he owes him, 
though Evald does not hear that last part. And finally, Isak grows closer to Marianne than he ever thought possible even just that morning, with the both of them having found new respect and love for the other. The film then concludes on a beautiful and peaceful note that sees Isak going to sleep for once content with his life, and falling back into the serene memories of his youth at the summer house, and a smile on his face as he dreams. <laughs>